Well, good morning, Vertical Church. Pray that everyone is doing well today. Pray that God has been blessing you as the old folks say, real good. There you go, careful. There it is. Uh, if you're new here, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan. I get to serve as lead pastor here at Vertical Church, and I appreciate you guys being with us today. We welcome you. Uh, uh, we thank you for joining us as we are continuing our current sermon series, Real Love. Continuing our current sermon series, uh, uh, Real Love. How many of y'all have been blessed by this so far? Amen, amen, amen. We're walking through the book of 1 John. Uh, we're walking through the book of 1 John, and so this has been an opportunity for us to go verse by verse, expository uh, style with us walking through 1 John, and I pray that it has been uh, good to you. Uh, uh, last week, we started a sermon entitled The Love Test, The Love Test, and we were talking about uh, essentially this idea that we test the genuineness of part of what John is doing as he's addressing uh, the Gnostics in the text. He's, he's, he's testing the love. So if you want to test to, to confirm the love of Christ is in you, uh, uh, we see it through the word. We say obedience. Everybody say obedience. obedience. We test the love of God, our love for God with obedience, our obedience to God. And it starts, we talked about this last week, the origin of love starts with knowing God, knowing God. And when we know him, it should produce obedience, and, and, and we do this by abiding in him. And so I showed you a graphic last week. Let me put that graphic up there for us, uh, Rob. Uh, uh, this picture, excuse me, Dre, put this picture of what it looks like to abide in Christ. And we said it starts with knowing God, then loving God, that leads to obeying God. And this idea is that obedience is a part of what it means to abide in Christ. It's not just something that we do uh, uh, in the morning when we read our Bible. No, abiding in Christ is living out our life every single day, knowing him, loving him, and obeying him. And so we talked about that. Today, I want to move forward uh, in this same text, John chapter number two, if you can meet me at verse number seven. I want to move forward from just abiding and knowing God. But what is the second part of what John says to us? That, that, that this love, this test, this, this love test that we have is how do we obey God when it comes to others? How do we obey God when it comes to others? So write this down if you can. Obedience is a seen love. Obedience is a seen love. So it's a love that we see. We know God's love, but, but we should see God's love. Watch this. In how we interact with other people, how we treat our neighbor, how we treat the foreigner, how we love our brother, all of those, we should see the love of God in how we interact with other people. So obedience is a seen love. Number one last week, obedience is a known love. But secondly, we want to talk about obedience is a seen love. Obedience has its origin in knowing God's love. Then obedience is seen in showing God's love. So the test here is saying, hey, if you really want to know, if you, you know God's love, evaluate and observe how you treat other people. All right, so let's look at the text. 1 John chapter number 2, verse 7 says this, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, something you've heard from old, an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard, and the same, at the same time it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light, watch this, and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Blinded his eyes. So, so we talked about that this uh, obedience comes and leads to its origin out of knowing God's love. But, but the response to knowing God's love is seen in how we love others. John points out here that if we know God, we will keep his word. We talked about this last week, this treasure. We will treasure, we will keep, we will value the commands in the word of God. But secondly, he talks about if we walk in the light, Jesus is that light that we see in John chapter number one. If he is that light, we will walk like him, that we will 
we will demonstrate, we will, we will replicate what he does, being that this love. And John actually starts this section off with, with this relational love, this love that's seen horizontally. He starts with his word, says, beloved. He, he's starting this, this portion of Scripture actually communicating what it should look like for us to love one another. He calls the reader beloved. And this is not John's idea, church. This is not John thinking, saying, well, this would be good for you guys to do. No, this is what John learned from Jesus himself. This idea that the love that you have for me when you abide in me, it should be seen in how we love one another. Let's go to John chapter number 15, verse 12 through 13. This is what Jesus says to the disciples. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Here it is. Jesus says, listen, loving one another, loving one another is a part of loving him. He says, greater love has no one than this, than someone laid down his life for his friend. So I want you to see this right after Jesus talks about abiding in him and, and how we are the branches, he is the vine and we are the branches. He goes into what is the fruit of that? It's this love for one another. Jesus says that what it looks like to love one another is it's the, it's the expression of your love for me on the inside. The life of Christ, listen to me, church, was fully self-sacrificial. Everything about his life was a self-sacrificing love. Therefore, the proof of us imitating the love of imitating Christ is exhibited in how we love each other. This love is that which seeks the highest good for someone else. Here's the question. Can people tell that you love God by how you love them? Can people see God's love through your love? Can people hear God's love through your love? See, I, I want to share this with you because, listen, if loving one another, if obedience is a seen love, then here it is that salvation is not just about changing us from, from lost to saved. No, it helps us not just become children of a God, but it helps us to become, watch this, a loving person. Let me say it again. You, you, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you also become a loving person. Let me say it one more time because I see you. I, I, I hear what you're saying. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are becoming a loving person. Thank you. Because we like the idea that salvation changes what we are. Before Christ, I was an enemy of Christ. Before Christ, I, I deserved the wrath of God. I, it changed, salvation changes my status. I am justified. My, my position has changed. It doesn't just change what you are, but it also should change who you are and how you are. Are y'all with me? Uh, oh God, I, I, I come to you because the gospel is not just, we talked about this last week, not just the saving knowledge that, that I do believe cognitively that Jesus Christ died for my sins. His sin, his death was sufficient to pay for the penalty of my sins. I also believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I've come to the knowledge of God, but I've also had an experience with him. And this experience with him has transformed me. When, I, when I've when i experienced his love, when I've understood that his love is so great and it abounds so great pouring over me, it changes how I interact with other people. So this is what we talked about last week. It's not just a saving knowledge, it's an experiential knowledge. Y'all remember what I said about my father? What's, what's the one thing my father has to have with every meal? Bread, biscuits, toast, crackers, something of the sort. I didn't read that in a book. I learned that through experience. And the experience that you have with God, it shapes your understanding of the love of God. This is why we practice and pursue spiritual disciplines. It's not so we can check the box so we can say we read our Bible or we prayed today or we fasted this week. No, it's because those things are tools used to increase our experience, to heighten our engagement, to help remove some of the distractions so that we can have an experiential knowledge of God. My faith is not because somebody told me. My faith is not just because I heard somebody preach it. It's not just because I read it in a good book. But my faith in Jesus Christ and his love for me is because of my experience. Experience, experience. 
When you know God deeply, when you know God deeply, you will realize, here it is, how unlovable, watch this, you are. We say it all the time here at Vertical Church that Jesus doesn't love you because you're lovable. He loves you because he's such a great and loving God. Yeah, I know there was a season in my life where I, man, I didn't want to go to the Bible. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to talk to saved people because they always make me feel convicted. You know, I, I really believe this. You haven't really read the Bible until the Bible's read you, <laughs> like, like it's till it, until it's told you about yourself. But, but listen, here it is. I need that conviction. I need those feelings. I need those moments to help me understand the depth and the greatness of God love for someone broken like me. And when I understand that love, it now helps me to properly see the people in the world around me. Watch this, people that I agree with, people that I don't agree with, people that I may like, people that I don't like, people that don't like me. I'm called to love because I've been loved. Somebody say amen. Amen. Listen, we got to understand this, that agreement was not a prerequisite for God's love for you. Alignment was not a prerequisite for God's love for you. Why are we making that a prerequisite for our love for somebody else? Jesus didn't wait for you to agree with him for him to say, okay, now I love you. Jesus didn't wait for you to say, uh, okay, now I'm going to live my life according to your word. Then he's going to love you. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, he died. While, while we were in the middle of our mess, while, while, we were, while we were enemies of God, he says, I love you. And, and what, what Jesus says here, what John is talking about, this new commandment, he's talking about the command of Christ. In John chapter number 50, he says, this new commandment I give you to love others the way. Watch this, I have loved you. The old commandment says, love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus says, no, I don't want you to love people the way you love yourself. No, I want you to love people the way I love you. But you cannot love people the way Christ loves you if you don't know how Christ loves you. Jesus raises the standard. Let's be honest, we're not all good at loving ourselves well. Okay. I mean, I know you love you some you. But you're not always the best person at loving you. No, I don't want to love you the way I love me. I want to love you the way Christ loved me. My goodness. Looking past my faults and seeing my needs. Not waiting for an apology before I love you. No, no, no. I want to love you the way Christ loved me. Here it is, church. Loving Christians and non-Christians alike. Love. Uh, uh, John says that 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 anyone that has hate against his brother. You got to hear this, his brother, his brother. I love this because John does not say because we don't have alignment, we can't be brothers. John is is, is saying here, we got to be careful because there are some people, let's be clear, even in the context of the church, that people that, that, that have some different theological views that we might not ascribe to. Some of them might not even be teaching the Bible the correct way. But I believe this, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead and by faith that you are saved, you are my brother. And I am called to love you like a brother, even when we disagree. I'll be honest with y'all, I, I get this sent to me quite often. I get pastors, other ministers that send, or, or people in the church send me videos of other preachers. And I know they send me the videos on social media because they want to say, Pastor, what do you think about this? I know what you're trying to get me to do. You want me to co-sign on condemning this pastor. (sighs) Now, let me just say this very clearly. Yes, sometimes it is wrong. Amen. It is wrong. I have no problem addressing what is out of sync with the gospel, what is not biblically sound taught doctrine. Absolutely. But what I'm not going to do is condemn my brother. What I'm not going to do is hate them. Just because I don't have agreement, here it is, my, my, my love is not predicated on what they do or say or feel. My love is based on what Jesus Christ has done for them and what he sees in them. Are y'all with me? John says, whoever has hate in his heart 
tells his brother, you can't, you can't claim to be abiding in Christ, walking in Christ, knowing Christ deeply, following him fully. You cannot claim those things and hate your brother at the same time. That, 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 is, that, is, that is inconsistent with the gospel. And here it is, I want you to see this. When, 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 when John is talking about hate here, he, he's using what, what is hyperbole, or he's using it comparatively. He's not saying there's extreme hate, but, but if you don't love your brother, he's using these polar opposites here. Jesus does this several times in Scripture. Uh, uh, one example would be when Jesus says, uh, uh, if you don't hate your brother, hate your sister, hate your mother, hate your father, hate your son, hate your daughter, you're not fit to follow me. Jesus is not saying literally to hate your parents. Amen. Make sure I got that clear, okay? Because y'all looked at me like, really? It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, listen, your love for me should be so great in comparison. He, he, he's talking about this imagery of like, listen, you should be following hard. You should love me more than you love your parents, love your wife, love your children, your children, your children. In concert, they did that. Mm, I like that. We should love him. It's high purple, but, but that should be the heart. We should love him that much. And what John is saying, listen, that this person who has hate in their heart for their brother, whether you agree or disagree, whether they're right or wrong, something's, something's wrong. Not, not, not with your, 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 your understanding of salvation, but your experience of it. You're, you're not properly experiencing the love of God in your life if it allows you to hate somebody else in your life. Uh, this is what happens when John says to the hater, the person that hates someone or does not love them, uh, it affects them three ways. It puts them in darkness. Write this down if you can. It puts them in darkness. In places in darkness outside of God's fellowship. You, you got to really think about this. Again, this is not talking about justification. This is not talking about that you've been, not been justified and you're not saved. We're, we're not trying to say that because somebody hates somebody else, they're, they're not saved. That's not what we're saying. We're saying this experiential knowledge of the salvation of Christ, you're not experiencing that when you're walking in hate for somebody else, especially somebody else that is a child of God. Nothing makes me more frustrated to see my children hate each other. Not only does it annoy me when they argue, but there's something significantly bothersome about my children and I, I've heard them say that before. I hate you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Y'all are both my children. Y'all are brothers and sisters. Y'all might not get along, but we can't, we can't have this hate. Listen to me, church. We can't have this hate between us. What, what, the Bible says that, that Jesus is our peace. Not peace for me, peace between you and me. Y'all hearing me? Uh, this, this, this person that walks in hate is in darkness. He also says that is an issue with direction. So this person that has hate, put that on the screen for me, right? His hate and direction. It leads to aimless activity in which he or she is in great spiritual danger in which there is the possibility to fall. I, I want you to understand this, that, that hatred in your heart will lead to sin in your hands. Man, you got to deal with that thing in your heart because if you're not careful, that thing in your heart going to have you live out some things that are not right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hatred in your heart will lead to hurt with your words. We got to deal with that. You, you're, you're misdirected when you have hate or disdain in your heart. Uh, uh, here it is. The third thing is delusion, delusion. Uh, uh, when you're in that place of darkness, it also results in confusion. Uh, the Christian who hates his brother loses his sense of spiritual direction in life, either partially or totally. You, you, you can lose your sense of direction because you, here it is, when, you're, when you got hatred in your heart, man, you know who you're really concerned about? It's you. This ain't about honoring God. This ain't about pleasing God anymore. This is about, this is about me. And see, here it is that John is still addressing the Gnostics in the text, those that, that, that did not agree with the same understanding of who the person of Christ was. 
And here it is, the Gnostics will say, hey, you know, the idea of coming to a certain knowledge, of ascending to knowing what's sufficient for salvation to prove that you were really a follower of Christ. And John is like, no, nah, bro, that ain't it. It ain't just what you know, it's what you show. <laughs> As I say, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> it, it's not just what you uh, proclaim, it's how you live out the love of Christ that you say that you've received. We can't say that we love others, we love God, and we don't love others. I can't say that, y'all. I, can't, I, I would be a horrible pastor to hate another pastor. I can, I can disagree. I can say I wouldn't recommend. But man, if you say you love Jesus Christ, we need to work out the other stuff. My heart is to see that you will come to know Christ in a deeper way. And so I want to make sure we understand this, that obedience is a seen love. It's a seen love. Uh, uh, thirdly here, obedience is built on a confident love, on a confident love. So, so, so John says, listen, love starts with knowing God. It is seen through obeying God with others, but it is confident. I have confidence. This is going to be tough for some of us today because some of us, to be honest, I don't know if I'm always having confidence with the love of God. I have to have confidence in the love of God. If I'm going to live this out with somebody else, John says that the old, that the dark spirit is passing away. It takes the spirit of God for me to love somebody else. Somebody say amen. It takes the spirit of God to be a loving person. I just want to go ahead and free somebody. This don't come natural. Careful. Um, but, but, but we need confidence to be reminded of that. And John, he takes these moments to, to before he observes it. Let me just remind you of some truth some truth, some truth that we all need to be reminded of. Because again, if you don't know the love that you have received, it will be hard to give that same love to somebody else. Uh, let's go to 1 John chapter number 2, verses 12 through 14. John says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. He starts over. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. John interrupts his observations to remind the church of these important truths. Here it is, I believe, of what they have already found in the love of God, what they have already found in the love of God. This is why you should be loving others, because you have found this truth in, in the love of God. Our confident love is seen through three things. I want you to write these down. Through God's forgiveness, through God's family, and through God's faithfulness. When we are abiding in Christ, when we are loving one another, these three things will come to us often and are most needed for sure. That we are reminded that we have been forgiven by God. This should help you love other people. You are part of the family of God. This should help you love other people. And you should remind of the faithfulness of God. This should help you to love other people. This should strengthen our love. We have confidence in this love. The first thing is this, is that we are forgiven. Everybody say forgiven. Man, I got to be reminded daily of the forgiveness of God. God. John starts by articulating the forgiveness of God. My confidence that God loves me is found in forgiveness. We're going to celebrate communion here in just a moment. When we celebrate communion, we are remembering not just Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but the love that caused him to pursue death, burial, and resurrection. That This love is, is towards me, not because I'm lovable, but because he's such a loving God. I love what Matthew says about this. Matthew articulates this when he's talking about Jesus being born. In Matthew chapter number 1, verse 21, she will bear a son, talking about Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Yeah, that's forgiveness. Man, that's my confidence in God's love. Listen to me, listen to me. It's not because my life is going the way I desire it. The absence, the presence of problems is, is not the absence of God. The presence of problems is not the absence of God's love for you. Just because it's challenging 
does not mean that God does not love you. Just because he didn't do what you wanted him to do does not mean that God does not love you. Just because he doesn't condone uh oh, what you're doing does not mean that God does not love you. The fact that we are forgiven of our sins, man, that's a beautiful picture of God's love. Let me show it to you right here, Romans chapter number 5, verse 6 through 11. He says, for while we were still weak, at the right, at right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He's talking about us. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare, e one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He says, listen, uh, uh, somebody might die for a good person. Uh, maybe they would die for a righteous person, but clearly nobody would die for an ungodly, unrighteous sinner like me. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ does for us. He dies for our sins to pay the penalty of our sins that we might be forgiven. I got confidence in the love of God. Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. I got, I got to make sure we understand this when we lay down the gospel. We deserve the wrath of God. In your sin, you are not just bad, you are dead. In your sin, you're just not, not unrighteous. You, you, you are an enemy of God. That is your status before faith in Jesus Christ. Only person I know that you knock on the door as an enemy and he sits you down as a guest. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, God, I love it, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we now have reconcil received reconciliation. He says, listen, it's one thing that he paid for the sins. It's another thing that he reconciled a relationship. The confidence that I have in the love of Christ is that he forgave me. H here's the thing. Before you would ask for forgiveness, he did what was necessary to forgive you. Before you even acknowledge that you were a sinner, he did what was necessary to forgive you. Before you had even mustered up the strength to say, God, my bad, he had already loved you enough and forgave you. My confidence in the love of God is found in forgiveness. Listen to me. Let me oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. It's not in how well I do. I know, I know some of us are, are like this. I know I, I can be like this. I feel like God doesn't love me because I don't perform. And God is saying, your performance was not the prerequisite for my love for you. <laughs> oh, man. You, you didn't cross every T and you didn't dot every I. He said, but I still loved you. I saw you in your mess. You said you would never, ever, 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 ever do it again. And you did it the next day. And I still loved you. There's nothing that you can do to make me love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make me love you less. This is the goodness of the love of God. And I have confidence in it. This is, the, this is the truth that I abide in so that I can love somebody else. This love overflows when I abide in it. The second thing, he says, so one, you're forgiven. But this picture of reconciliation, we have confidence in the forgiveness of God, but we also have confidence in the family of God. So, so this forgiveness of our sin positions us to be reconciled into the family of God, into the family of God. I've said it here before, that everybody is not a child of God. Let me say it again. Everybody is not a child of God. Everybody is a creation of God, but only those that have accepted Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior are adopted into the family of God. So when you are saved, when you are unsaved, when you are lost, when you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are merely his creation. He loves you. He adores you. He wants the best for you, but he wants to invite you back into the family that sin brought you out of. So now we have forgiveness, but we're also part of the family. It's right here in the text, 1 John 2, 13. It says, I'm writing to you, fathers, 
because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know him as father. John writes to three specific groups here, children, young men, and fathers, speaking specifically to different age groups, not age groups, but different spiritual maturity levels or different levels in their walk with Christ. And he says, listen, you have come to know him as father. So, so I, my sins have been paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ, but, but, but I'm not an orphan. Man, I, I, I'm not left out there to fend for myself. No, no, I'm invited into the family of God. I'm invited into the community of God. I am invited as a seat to a seat at the table. And John says, listen, you, you have this new family uh-huh, that, that God is not this distant a deity that is looking down on you, judging you, waiting to catch you in sin. No, no, no. He, he is a loving father that we, we call out to him and cry out to him. Abba, Father, he cares for us. He, he wants to be near us. He, he wants to hold us when, when we are broken. He wants to make things better. He is our provider. He, he is our hope. He, he is our healer. He is our loving father. And in this, I have confidence in his love. Now, now let me say this here, because I don't want us to miss this, that, that a lot of times some of us struggle with the love of a father from, like God because we struggle with love with our earthly fathers. This is very real. Your, your earthly father wounds will influence and affect your relationship with your heavenly father. It's unfortunately part of the fallenness and brokenness of our world. But let me just insert this here to all the fathers in the room. A part of your responsibility as a father is to help your child not know how much you love them, but how much God loves them. Because their relationship with you will in turn affect their relationship with their Heavenly Father. The idea of of family is designed to help us to understand the relationship with God. The idea of marriage, the, the, the marriage that we see that God gives us in Scripture, Your marriage ain't about you. Your marriage should be pointing to the love of God. Your parenting isn't about you making your children happy. Your parenting should point to the love of God. And we are invited into the family of God. And that family gives us confidence in his love. Lastly, right here, we we see we have confidence because of the forgiveness of God, we have confidence because we're part of the family of God. But thoroughly, we have confidence because of the faithfulness of God. He says to the young men, to the, to the fathers, to the children, he says to the young men specifically, you are, you, have, you are strong and you have overcome the enemy. Here it is. Let me just stop here and say this, that, that when you are in fellowship with Christ, it, do, it does not mean your life will be absent of a fight. The Bible says we war not against flesh and blood, but against What? Spiritual principalities, there are things that we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to fight. Y'all, y'all, listen to me. We're going to have to fight to abide in Christ. There are so many things in this world that are pulling us to distract us. We have to fight to believe. We have to fight to hold fast to the faith. Faith, we have to fight to hold fast and stay the course. But God is what? Faithful. He says it right here. God is faithful. Through his word, 1 John 2, 14, says, I write to you, brothers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, you young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and the word of God abides in you, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Because the word of God abides in you. Not because you're so good, not because you're so holy, not because you're anointed, Amen but because the word of the Lord abides in you. It is the faithfulness of God, not the faithfulness of you. 
And his faithfulness is a reminder of his incredible love towards me. I have confidence in the love of God that I can do nothing to, to, to cause God to stop loving me. He can be disappointed with what I do, but it doesn't mean he doesn't love me. And his confidence helps me to share the love with others. Here it is, number four. We're closing right here. Number four. So, 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 um, obedience is a seen love. Obedience comes and is strengthened. We have confidence in a confident love. But fourthly, obedience, here it is, produces a focused love. Everybody say focused love. Juan John does not leave us here without a warning. He, he offers a, a warning. Be cautious. Be very careful. Let's, let's read it right here. John chapter number 2, verse 15 through 17. Let's read the text. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Y'all, we could do a whole sermon series just on that one sentence. My goodness. John, leave me alone, Brody. He says, do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oh, my God. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but what, what, whoever does the will of God abides, y'all, underline this word, forever. John, John warns us here. He warns us. He warns us. He gives us the truth of God in verses uh, uh, 12 through, through 14 here. But 15 through 17, he warns us about the lies of the world. You got to see this. Because these are, these are what we consider to be three truths of the world. These are things that the world would say it could be true, but we got to learn from this. Here we've got to learn. Uh, the world will, will, can't give you what you need. This is the truth we need to know. The world can't give you what you need. The second thing we got to learn, it can't give you what it promises. The world can't give you what it promises. And then thirdly, it can't give you what will last. It can't give you what will last. It can't give you what you need. It can't give you what it promises, and it can't give you what will last. You got to see this. He says, the world can't give you what you need. Focus on God. Focus on God. The human heart is longing to be loved and to love. And the truth of the matter is, is we want something that the world cannot give us. And John says, don't give your love to the world because it will not give you the love you are actually looking for. What you need will not be filled by the things that are in this world. I, I know some of you here, you think, oh, I just need to get married. That ain't what you need. If I just have children, no, 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 listen to me. That ain't what you need. Let me be the one to no, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the, the things that you think are in this world, if I just made a little more money, man, that, that, I'll, be, I'll be comfortable. No, 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 no. That ain't going to give you what you need. If enough people like what I do, no, that, that, that ain't what you need. The things of this world cannot give you what you need. You're going to find that in Christ and Christ alone. That gap, that hole in your heart can only be filled by the love of God. Trying to pursue stability, identity, anything in this world, possessions, what you can acquire, your influence, it will never give you what you need. Focus on God. Don't be distracted by the things of this world. Uh, he says so, so. It won't give you what you need. Focus on God. It can't give you what it promises. The world can't give you even what it promises. Focus on God. The world here uses this picture to present one of the most dangerous distractions to men and women alike of all ages across all time. You think if you get this thing, this will make everything better. We, we have this picture in our world of what success is, and it's more money, and it's houses and cars. And Man, I cannot tell you how many times I've walked with people that had what I thought I wanted, but they didn't have what I really needed. John 1, 2, 16 says, for all the world is in the world. Here it is, write these down. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life 
It is not the Father, but it is from the world. we got to be careful of what we call our appetites, our affections, and our ambitions. Here, here it is. Write it down. Our appetites. I see this in the text. Our appetites. This is the desire of the flesh. Trying to fulfill our natural desires in a way that is contrast to God's design and direction. Uh, I would consider say sin or unrighteousness is trying to do God's thing your way. Say it again. Trying to do God's thing your way. We live in a culture where we celebrate doing our thing our way. And what happens a lot of times, we talked about this idea of changing the scale last week and move, erasing the line of saying and keep moving it back. All we're trying to do is to say, God, I believe that's a good thing, but I want to do it my way. That's trying to fulfill, here it is, your, 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 your appetite, appetites. We think if, if we do, if we get just what we want, it'll be enough. Have y'all, I don't know about anybody else, every time I eat, I'll get hungry again. Y'all, I'm just sitting in that truth right now because I'm hungry (laughs) right now. Here's the sad part about it. Have you ever ate out with somebody? You order your food, they order their food, and their food comes to the table, and it looks better than your food. (laughs) Oh, that's the worst. Oh, that's the worst. The only thing that's worse than that, only thing that's worse than that is that you're sitting with somebody that thinks your food looks better than their food. My wife used to have to ask. Now I just throw both my hands up. <laughs> let me, let me taste that. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, your appetite said you wanted what's on your plate. You said you wanted this. You told the man and the woman you wanted this medium well with asparagus. Your appetite, God help me, is insufficient because you never have enough. Got to be careful what I'm after. Want more of it. We think that if we have what we want, it'll be enough. And it's never enough, not. And when you're after your appetites for the things of the world, it will lie to you and tell you that it will give you everything you thought it would, and it never does. If I just get this, I'll be good, y'all, and you won't. I, I remember um, discipling a young man, and he was, you know, he was adamant. He's like, man, I just, I just feel like if we made more money, the past I could drive, drive a truck like yours. You, you can drive this one if you want to for the right number. I'll say this one right now, Ben. That man, if I just had more, more money, man, yeah, this this will be, this will, everything will just be right with my family, man. In that same conversation, I'm trying to counsel him in his marriage, and I just stop him. I say, man, you do realize, if you make more money, you just go home. I had the same argument in a nicer ride. <laughs> It'll be the same argument with heated seats. <laughs> you, you'll get in the same argument and lay in a king-size bed because you're not dealing with the real issue. It's your heart. You have an appetite for things that will not satisfy you. Got to watch your appetites. Third one, he says it right here. So there's, there is the, the, the lust of the eyes, there is a, the desires of the flesh, and then there is a, the, 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 the affections. Affections. Affection, the lust of the eyes, the desire of the eyes. So just like our natural desires, sometimes we see stuff. Ooh. And what we see affects our appetite. What we see affects our appetite. What we see affects our appetite. Some stuff we ain't, we looking at the wrong thing. What are you looking at? That has, has caused you to have affections for things that are, that has caused you to disobey God that is in contrast to the word of God. You ever heard the term, your, your, your eyes are bigger than your stomach? 
<laughs> oh, man. Y'all, I'm excited because Thanksgiving is coming. My God. <laughs> they don't make the plates big enough, Doc. No, no, you don't go back. You go with two plates. You don't trust the people you live with because they might get the food before you get there. Yana, I got to help you out. DJ, talk to your boy. No, we just two plate that thing, player. The devil eggs will be gone if I wait to go back. I can't have it. The devil eggs are the first to go. They only make eight for some reason. It's 12 in the box. Why do y'all only making eight devil eggs? My bad, Ralph. I'm sorry. I had a moment. Stay on task, my man. The affections of my heart. I love devil <laughs> eggs. Y'all, don't make me know, okay? I don't want y'all to feel that pressure. Affections of our heart cause us to, be, to, to pursue things that are not of God. There have been times where I've asked God to fulfill my desire, not his promises, because the affections of the things of this world that I have. And if I'm not careful, this, listen to me, church, what ends up happening is when you have affections that are above or in contrast to God, when, when God doesn't give you those things, those things that are your affections, you interpret it to mean that God doesn't love you, not that you're loving the wrong thing. Well, I wanted this, so God didn't give it to me, so he must not love me. What? We've got to be careful of our affections. Thirdly is our ambitions, the pride of life. Man, I've got to move the pride of life. Sometimes it's not just affections, but it also leads into what our ambitions are. We, we, the things that bring us glory more than they bring God glory, man, we've got to be careful. Having these vain things so we can, let's be honest, boast in ourselves. Glorifying self instead of God is the epitome of the pride of life. Making an idol of the things, your career, your status, your children, your achievements is the epitome of the pride of life. Our ambitions should be shaped by the gospel and the work of Christ. Let me say that again. Our ambitions should be shaped by the gospel and the work of Christ. The reason why my ambitions can be shaped by the gospel is because my identity is shaped by the gospel. When I know who I am in Christ, I don't have to pursue the things of this world to give me my identity. When I know who I am in Christ, I don't have to be ambitious of things of this world to give me my identity. So I can have ambitions shaped by Christ to say, simply say this, Lord, this is what I would like to do, but what do you want to do? My ambitions should be shaped by Christ. A.W. Tozer said like this, he says, the pronouns my and mine seem innocent but are verbal symptoms of the disease of sin. It's about me. It's about what I get. It's about my comfort. It's about my preferences. It's a symptom of sin. And John says, these things that you think you want, they can't give you what they promise. They can't give you what they promised. Y'all, I don't know if y'all seen these commercials, but the iPhone 15 is out. Made of titanium or something. I don't know what it's made of. It's like, it's the same phone. But the way they got the camera shots, you would think it was a new phone. Can I, can I be honest? Some of y'all iPhone people, y'all going to be mad at me. They took the charging port off the Samsung and put it on the iPhone. It was like, we got a new phone. It's promising you something better, but it can't give you what it... This is not about iPhones or Samsungs here. Just, I'm just saying. So here's the last thing, last thing right here. He says, be careful. You got to have a focus. You have a focus, love. Last reason, he says, because what the world will give you it will not last. This is tough right here. It, it will not last. So focus on God. This contrasting idea uh, with these prevailing ones that, that these things are temporary, they're fleeting. 
uh, uh, you'll never be satisfied. This is a real issue with all of these things in this world. They won't last. Uh, man, the, the earth will, will pass away, but, but the word of the Lord will, will remain. He says this, you have found this. He says this 12 through 14. You have found God to be true. You have found that he is forgiven. You have found him to be a father. You have found him to be faithful. You got to understand that he remains in everything in this world. It will not last. It is an empty imitation, worthless and fake. It is temporary compared to the sustaining love of who God is. Everything in this world world will pass away it is simply thank you holy spirit a sign to point you to god your money should not be your idol it should remind you that he is jehovah jireh he is the lord that is your provider your children are wonderful they look just like you some of them act like you praise god but they should not be your idol they should remind you of the miraculous power of god you should see your community it's great to love people and to be loved by people but that should not be your idol it should point you to the incredible love of God because only his love will last everything in this world will pass away even the good stuff my God it will pass away you will pass away man I but, but what we have will, with God is forever. Oh, man. I, I love this. It's, it's Communion Sunday. My favorite part of communion is when Jesus says, I will not drink it again until we do it together in my Father's kingdom. Oh, man, I'm so glad that I can have confidence in this love that what Jesus says, it will not pass away, that my health will pass away, my riches will pass away, my influence will pass away, my leadership will pass away, but the love of God, it will last forever. And my daddy would say, one of these old days. And, and, and it won't be long. I, 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 I'm going to be in glory. I'm going to be in heaven. And I'm going to be with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And that heaven and earth shall not pass away. And we'll be able to sit around that table with our heavenly father and take communion remembering the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for our sins to forgive us of every wrong that we had ever done and that we will ever do. We'll sit around the table with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and tell the story of the goodness and the grace of God. We'll sit around the table with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and remind them, you remember that stuff that all passed away? I'm so glad that I didn't love those things. I'm so glad I didn't hold those things. I'm so glad I didn't cherish those things. But it was the love of God. And it remained. It remains. Young people, look at me. Look at me. If there is anything that you need to grab hold of, grab hold of something that won't pass away. Grab hold of something that won't pass away. And that something is the only thing that's Jesus. Oh, man. Grab hold of it. It won't pass away. 